Thank you, Timothy, for reading the scriptures. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Father, we thank you for this day that we get to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Now, as we look into this passage, we ask that you would be with us. May the words that I speak be the words that you want your people to hear. We ask all this in Jesus' name. So, Christos Anesti. Let's try that again, yeah? Christos Anesti. Alethos Anesti. Okay, good, good. It's going to happen next year also, so you might as well, you know. I think I've done this uh, every year for the last four or five years. Anyway, anyway. In the novel Faded Perfection, author Cassandra Giovanni writes, Death abides by no one's rules. It takes what it pleases without consciousness to its decisions. It destroys what it will. It took the pieces of perfection I once knew and shattered them. Now what remains are shards of a dream, drawing blood with every step. Death is indeed a great destroyer, but it is also a great equalizer. Rich or poor, strong or weak, we all know that it is death that awaits us. And it is the fear of death that drives most human actions. Now, it had been about three years since the day that Peter and his brother Andrew had dropped their nets and followed this itinerant creature in Galilee. Jesus was his name, and he had such a welcoming look that neither they nor their friends, James and John, could ignore the invitation that he extended them. All four, fishermen by trade, had left everything to follow Jesus. Now, I'm sure that uh, their other friends and their family members had some choice words to say about their decision. How foolish. How rash. How reckless. How selfish. But they, like so many other Jews of their day, were yearning for God to finally act, to destroy the foreign occupiers and establish once more David's throne. But since the time of Zedekiah in the early 6th century BC, they had not had an, a Davidic king on the throne. And even Zedekiah actually was only a puppet of Nebuchadnezzar. Then, after they had joined Jesus, began this wonderfully frightening and confusing journey. It was confusing because Jesus employed some commonly used terms like kingdom of God, or eternal life, or glory, and he seemed to use them in ways that were different from the common usage. And it was frightening, because his redefinition of these words drew him into direct conflict, not with the despised Romans, but with his fellow Jewish people. He collided with the Herodians about the legitimacy of Herod's rule. He debated with the Sadducees about the doctrine of the resurrection. And he clashed with the Pharisees, those people who, with whom he had the most affinity over their purity practices and their interpretation of scripture. While the common and powerless people loved him, he seemed to have a bone to pick with everyone in power. Finally, of course, it came down to his last week, when he seemed to raise the stakes even higher. And eventually, the Jewish leaders realized that they could not silence him, and they could not convince him to change his views. And so, as we saw on Good Friday, they managed to twist the arm of Pilate, even though he himself was convinced of Jesus' innocence. And that unique life that had attracted so many, so many who were downtrodden, was silenced on the cross. Most of his disciples deserted him, and he even experienced abandonment by the Father. But his disciples too felt abandoned by him. We should not forget that. They had left everything to follow him. And on Good Friday, with Jesus' death, all their dreams and all their hopes that they had entertained just came crashing down, destroyed, became shards that they would trample upon drawing blood. 
death had claimed Jesus, whom they had believed was going to be their great deliverer. Death, this great equalizer, had claimed the life of even this innocent person. It was a ravaging, prowling beast that swallowed everything indiscriminately, anything that came in its path. And the true measure of its indiscriminateness is that it had now swallowed even Jesus. Moreover, Jesus had died on the cross, which according to Deuteronomy meant that he was cursed by God. And so even though he had spoken challenging yet comforting words, and even though he had performed many miracles of compassion, it was clear that God had rejected, them, rejected him. But if God had rejected him, this meant that even if there was a resurrection, then when God raised everyone, Jesus himself would be among those condemned by God because he was cursed for having hung on a tree. And this would mean that everything he had said about God also perhaps was a lie. We who live on this side of Easter cannot even begin to fathom the grief and despair that would have overtaken those first disciples. We who know that the hope of the resurrection has, is a fulfilled reality cannot even attempt to place ourselves in their shoes. Thankfully, their despair and grief was cut short on their first Easter. John tells us that Mary Magdalene visited the tomb to find it empty. And then in a panic, after all, where is this body? There was no plan from, the, from them to take his body somewhere. Where's his body? She's, so in a panic, she ran back, reported this to Peter and the beloved disciple. They obviously now getting you know, uh, infected with her panic. They run to the tomb and they find it just as she had reported. Later that day, Jesus meets Mary. She, of course, doesn't recognize him, mistaking him for a gardener. And then he visits the 10 of the re remaining 11 disciples. Remember, Thomas was not present that first. A week after this, he meets Thomas as well. John then seemingly concludes his gospel with the words, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of, the, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. But to our surprise, the gospel does not end. It continues. And it is here that we find the passage that we heard read today. The events of chapter 20 seem to be located in Jerusalem itself because of the mention of Jewish leaders in verse 19. But now the location has changed and the disciples are in Galilee. Why were they there? You see, Jesus' words remained confusing to them. When he met them on Easter evening, the 10 of them, he had said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. What were they to make of these words? What did Jesus mean by, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you? Now, the Father had sent Jesus to reveal the character and nature and the plans of God. And if that was true, then it meant that Jesus was going to send his disciples to reveal the character and nature and plans of God. But they knew that they were clueless at that time. They had thought that Jesus was cursed by God because he had died on a cross. His resurrection clearly called that belief into question, as well as many other things that they had assumed. For one thing, they believed that the resurrection was a single event at which everyone who had died would be raised and then God would judge everyone. The resurrection of only Jesus and no one else called into question that belief as well. For it was clear that he had been raised and his body transformed, but no such transformation happened to anyone else. And so not only was Jesus not cursed, but it seemed clear that the resurrection was not a single event, but actually one that now had to be thought of as happening in two stages in time. 
In addition to this, they had believed that the resurrection would be the last event that God would, would do before he transformed this new creation and made it into his new creation. The resurrection, they believed, was linked inextricably to this final judgment, which was the precursor to the new heavens and the new earth, making the resurrection then the final event in time. That too, clearly, had been an incorrect belief, since time seemed to be moving on as usual despite the resurrection of Jesus. So they knew that they were in no place to go to the world as Jesus represented us. Furthermore, even though Luke tells us that there was 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, it is clear he was not continually with his disciples. Rather, like a good teacher, he would have been preparing them for his ascension, after which he would no longer be present with them physically. So he would have appeared to them initially to convince them that he had been raised and raised to a new form of physicality. That was important, that they recognized that this is not a vision or a hallucination. They had to, he had to convince them. And these appearances then initially would have been very close to each other. But he would have then started weaning them off this dependence on his appearance because this was what life was going to be like after his ascension. He had to prepare them for that also. And so he would have spaced out his appearances, slowly increasing the periods between successive appearances with the intention of making the disciples more acclimatized to his not being around. But it is clear that even at the ascension, the disciples had not grasped many of the things that we today take for granted. They ask, is it, are you going to restore the kingdom now? In other words, they actually were quite unprepared even till Pentecost. But Jesus had said that he was sending them as the Father had sent him. And now they had seen the, you know, the, how full of conflict Jesus' ministry had been. Many times during his ministry, his life had been threatened. Some people had wanted to push him off a cliff. Others had wanted to stone him. And then finally, the Jewish authorities had managed to get him crucified. Was this something that the Jew uh, disciples were ready for? Hardly. At the very least, it was clear to them that they had completely misunderstood God's ways and plans when it came to Jesus and his work. How could they represent Jesus when, on the one hand, they could not even understand what was going on, and on the other hand, the task was actually dangerous to them? What would you do in such a situation? If you were entrusted with a world-altering task that you could barely understand, and if you knew that you would be risking your very life attempting to fulfill this task, how would you respond? I don't know about you, but I know that I would have been quite paralyzed, paralyzed to such an extent that I would not have been able to think clearly. And what do we do when we are not able to think? Exactly what the disciples did when they were paralyzed by the daunting task ahead and their glaring unpreparedness. We resort to habits. We resort to routine. We resort to what we can do without thinking because now we are incapable of thinking. And so did the disciples. They knew how to fish. And so they went fishing, but they caught nothing during the night. In the morning, a stranger on the shore calls out to them and discovering that they had not caught anything, he says, throw your net onto the right side of the boat and you will find some. For us, mostly non-fisher folk, I think, right? Yes, okay, I don't think there's any fisherman here. But anyway, for us urban people, doesn't have to be fishermen, but for us urban people, we have no idea about what's going on here. Why the right side? Why were the disciples only casting the net on the left side? That, that's what it would mean, right? Actually, if I were around in the boat, I would have cast the net on the right side. And so would Santosh and anyone else here who is left-handed. Let me explain. You see, while casting while doing uh, cast fishing, that is casting the net and fishing that way, you need to cast the net as far away from the boat as possible so that the fish do not suspect anything because there is a boat, right? I mean, they can see that. So you want the net to be as far away from the boat as possible. This means you need to throw the net with your dominant hand. 
Right-handed person needs to throw it with, with, with the right hand, right? So that you're getting the distance. But at the same time, you're moving ahead, you need to throw the, uh, the net ahead of the boat so that as you go ahead, you're not dragging the net behind because as soon as the fish sees something is dragging, they're not going to get there. At the same time, you don't want to plow into the net, so it needs to be away and yeah, very practical. So, so a right-handed person would throw the net with his right hand or her, her. There weren't any women fishermen at that time. So his net with the right hand yeah, <laughs> towards the left side of the boat. Left-handed people, the right side of the boat. So I don't know if there were any left. Maybe there were left-handed people. Let's see. Okay, anyway. The stranger asked them to do something that was non-habitual. Now, remember, they had gone there because they just wanted to do something habitual, right? And he's asking them now, you need to start thinking. Huh? So it's something non-habitual. He asked them to throw the net onto the right side, therefore using their non-dominant hand. Note that John makes it very clear that till now the disciples have not recognized Jesus. But why would they listen to a stranger? Why would they listen to a stranger, especially when the stranger was asking them to do something that was uncomfortable, that went against their experience, that made them actually pay attention to what they were doing when they just wanted to clock out? At another time, Peter had stated that they had fished all night but then agreed to do what Jesus had asked him because it was Jesus. At that time, he recognized it was Jesus. This time, no. Not the case here. John does not tell us, however, what the disciples were thinking, but only that they went ahead and cast their nets to the right side of the boat. Perhaps that initial call, something in the voice, whatever it is, persuaded them to do this. And it is then that the beloved disciple realizes that the person on the shore is Jesus. When they get to the shore, they find that Jesus already has a fire going with some fish on it and he's got bread from somewhere. Well, you know, anyway, he can make bread. from. <laughs> and he asks them for some, some of their catch. He then asks them to join him for breakfast and then John tells us, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Many interpreters have recognized that John ends chapter 20, which what seems to be a conclusion, as I mentioned earlier. But then they are baffled about chapter 21. Some have proposed that the original version of John ended with chapter 20, and chapter 21 was added later. However, we have no manuscript evidence of this, so we should attempt to understand chapter 21 in its present position. It is clear that John intends the first 20 chapters to lead the reader to that belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, as he has stated in the, at the end of chapter 20. But does this mean we have reached the end of the journey? Is coming to faith in Jesus the destination? Certainly not, because John has stated that through believing you may have life in his name. The goal of belief is to have life in Jesus' name. But what does that life look like? And that is why John has chapter 21. It answers that question. Remember what Jesus said. He said, peace I, I give you, receive the Holy Spirit. And then it was an issue about forgiveness of sins. John chapter 21 deals with those two issues. Later, forgiveness of sins with Peter. And now we're talking about how to do, deal with the Spirit, even though the Spirit is not mentioned. I believe John has given us five things that we need to do, uh, be open to as we attempt to live our lives with Jesus in view of his resurrection. Five things, okay. So let me, where is this? Why is this not going to the right place? I have no idea what's happened here. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I need to do this so that I recover my thing. Five things, there you go. Jesus never had to deal with this. Okay. 
First, Jesus is often not recognizable and his ways often not recognizable. When he called out to them from the shore, he was a stranger. Even at the end, while they were having breakfast, they wanted to ask him who he was, but somehow knew it was him. There was some kind of a, yeah, is it? Yeah, you know, that's sort of thing. Jesus is mysterious, you see, difficult to pin down. The danger we run is thinking of how he has acted in our lives and then using that as a model for how he acts in everyone else's life. Yeah, that is what we, we love to do. He's done A, B, and C for me, and he better not do P, Q, and R for you. He needs to do A, B, and C for you as well and for everyone else in the whole wide world, right? That's it. We attempt to make our lives normative. But we should avoid putting Jesus in a box, avoid trying to put Jesus in a box. They did that 20 centuries ago, it didn't work. Jesus often comes to us as a stranger. In the words of Albert Schweitzer, he comes to us as one unknown. Without a name as of old by the lakeside, he came to those men who knew him not. When Jesus first called these fishermen from Galilee, they did not know him. And now at the end, just after the resurrection, they still do not recognize him. Hence, we should approach our lives with him with utmost humility, recognizing that he could be calling us in ways that we could never have foreseen through means we could hardly ever consider. Second, Jesus often calls us to do things that go against the grain. The seasoned fishermen, experienced in throwing the nets to the left, were asked to go against all their experience and throw the nets to the right. Nothing in their past experience would have led them to consider such an action. They had always cast their nets to the left. Until Jesus had first come along, they had been able to put food on the table with this practice. What was the need to do anything different? Why fix something that's not broken, right? But the new life Jesus calls us to is a life of unpredictability. However, we humans love our lives to be predictable. We like knowing what kinds of actions lead to what kinds of results. But now, with the spirit in charge of Jesus' mission in the world, the patterns we have gotten used to might be rendered obsolete. And if we stick to only what we have tried and trusted, we may actually find that we are working against the purposes of Jesus as mediated by the spirit. It is no wonder then that earlier in John's Gospel, Jesus likens the spirit to wind. If you tell me there's a wind from the northeast right now, I wouldn't be surprised two minutes later you tell me it's from the southeast. No one is going to say, you told me it was from the northeast. I'm sorry, did you lie then or now? No. This calls for immense flexibility on our part. The Spirit may do one thing today and decide to do another thing tomorrow, may do one thing for you and another thing for another person. We should not make into a sacred practice anything that we have witnessed the Spirit work through. Doing that would only make us accuse those who are actually attuned to the Spirit of God, just as the Jewish leadership accused Jesus himself of being in partnership with Satan. Since there are billions of individuals and thousands of people groups, we should expect the spirit to go against the grain more often than we do now. Third, Jesus often calls us to do things we are not particularly skilled at. He told the disciples to cast the nets to the right, using their non-dominant hands to hurl the nets out of the boat. Try doing some common task with your non-dominant hand and you will see how difficult this is. When you go home, try it. Try brushing your teeth. Hopefully you'll do that. But anyway, try brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand. Cut an apple. Have a bath. Hopefully you'll do that also. Yeah. Breaking an egg also. Try doing that with your non-dominant hand. You will experience how dependent you are on that dominant hand. The skills that you take for granted with your dominant hand are nearly impossible with the other hand. And so Jesus calls us to do things that we would never imagine we could do. 
Once again, in the words of Albert Schweitzer, the demands of Jesus are difficult because they require us to do something extraordinary. At the same time, he asks us to regard these acts of goodness as something usual and ordinary. Think of Peter and John at the temple gate. Addressing this lame man, Peter says, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. To a lame person, silver and gold would be a princely gift, but it would not have changed his state. Once the money had run out, he would have found himself back again at that temple gate begging for alms. The ability to walk, on the other hand, is something we cannot really put a price tag on. If you have ever sprained an ankle or a knee or fractured a leg bone, you will know how much it affects your life. We are so used to walking that anything that affects our ability to walk is a serious encumbrance. But Peter speaks as though this extraordinary gift of the ability to walk is run of the mill. In effect, he says, I do not have what you want and expect. I have something else. I don't know if you want that. You know, I can make you walk in the name of Jesus. He says it in such a matter-of-fact, plain manner, without any fanfare. Something that would be extraordinary in the old creation is run-of-the-mill in the new creation. And this is why we Christians expect healing in response to prayer. For if God has inaugurated his new creation in the resurrection of Jesus, we can dare ask for it. We have new creation expectations today. Fourth, Jesus is always ahead of us. When the disciples came ashore, they find that the fire was already lit. Fish were already cooking there. Wherever Jesus calls us, whatever he asks us to do, we should remember that it is he who, through his spirit, initiates the spread of the gospel in the world. Hence, if one of us suddenly gets a new vision, a new idea, we should not be timid. Rather, we should understand that Jesus is the one who, having defeated Satan on the cross, is in the business of reclaiming this world for himself. Now, each of us has access only to a small, infinitesimal part of God's overarching plans for his creation. We do not know how what we do contributes to the larger scheme of things. But we should go forth boldly, not fearing defeat, for Jesus goes ahead of us. In their book, When Dreams Come True, authors Leslie and Alec Luddy write, I had a God who knew my every desire. He also knew how I would fall, and yet he was waiting on the other side of my failure and my shattered dreams with some dreams of his own. You see, even if we fail, Jesus still calls us to follow him. And if he says, follow me, it can only mean that he is leading the way ahead of us. He is the one who, even if we fail, will be waiting for us on the other side of our failures, waiting either to revive our dreams or to infuse our battered selves with new dreams of the new creation. For if even the death of the cross is woven into the grand plan as the center of God's glory, then surely he can redeem even our failings, which are surely minor in comparison. <clears throat> Fifth, Jesus asks us to contribute to the task he has given us. When the disciples come ashore, they realize that Jesus has already got a fire going and some fish cooking on it. But Jesus still asked them to give them a few of the fish they had caught. Jesus is the one who initiated this encounter by calling out to them while they were still out at sea. He could see how many of them were there, but even if he couldn't, surely he knew it would not be more than 11. He had managed to get some fish from somewhere. We can speculate about where that was, but anyway, surely he could have obtained more. Surely he, could, he did obtain enough for everyone. But even if he had enough for all, he asked them to bring some of what they caught. Whether they brought just one fish or all 153 that they had caught, the bottom line is that Jesus asked them to bring something to the table. 
Did he need their contribution? Could he not have prepared a breakfast for all of them and perhaps some thousands others without having to, them to bring some fish? Surely he could have. None of us are going to argue that Jesus asked them for some fish because he could not prepare the meal. Rather, Jesus asked them for some fish because this is the restored dignity of God's image bearers in the new creation. We will all have productive roles to play in the new creation and discipleship today gives us a foretaste of that reality and bears witness to it in this world. So from the youngest to the oldest, the weakest to the strongest, the uneducated to the educated, Jesus has roles for us today. We may think that what we bring to the table is insignificant, and from the perspective of the world, it may very well be insignificant. <clears throat> but when Jesus gives you the dignity of joining him in his mission in this world, contributing your gifts and your talents for that purpose, even the tiniest of things that we contribute will eventually be seen as irreplaceable and essential for the glory of the new creation. But most of us do not see things this way. <clears throat> in his books, book uh, Shattered Dreams, author Larry Crabb writes, the problem sincere Christians have with God often comes down to a wrong understanding of what this life is meant to provide. <clears throat> Most often, we are given a picture of God that does not allow us to be open to the idea of this God who invites our partnership in the new creation. Unfortunately, we speak of God in Greek philosophical categories, claiming he is omnipresent and omnipotent and omniscient, etc., whatever omnis you have. But by doing this, we actually deny the storied nature of our scriptures, which tell us about a God who deigns to ask his human creatures to become partners in his mending of this world and in providing signposts that anticipate the new creation. This omniscient God was once a babbling baby in Mary's arms. This omnipotent God was once an apprentice who barely lift a hammer. This omnipresent God was once nailed, not everywhere, to a cross on a hill outside Jerusalem. You see, God has chosen to show his power through things that are weak, his wisdom through things that are foolish, and his glory through things that are shameful. This was the pattern of Jesus' life leading up to his death, and if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, there is absolutely no reason to doubt the pattern stays the same. So, the new creation too, will be characterized by the weak, shameful foolishness revealed on the cross. God calls us weak creatures in ways that are not readily recognizable to do tasks that are against our normal pre predispositions, that require skills that we do not have so that we can recognize that he has already gone ahead of us where he calls us to contribute ourselves to the task. For this is the message of Easter. It is not that I can face tomorrow because Jesus lives as that song says, making Jesus' resurrection out to be something significant only to my life. <clears throat> it is not that, as someone has said, that God has turned the inevitability of death into the invincibility of life. We all are going to die. Death is an inevitable. It is not that the resurrection gives my life meaning and direction and the opportunity to start over no matter what my circumstances. I don't know where people get these stuff from. Easter is not about me. It's not about you. It's not about anyone individually. Easter is the message that God in Jesus has inaugurated his new creation and calls us to be his agents who partner with him to give the world anticipations of the glory of the new creation. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, 
We ask that you would indeed make us your partners. Give us visions and dreams as the prophet Joel announced. We ask that we would be attuned to the working of your spirit, to the leading of your spirit. Take us wherever you want us to go, Father. And when we reach there, let us find you waiting for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.